Thank you. So I want to start with just a quick um, level setting about what it means to give to support a charity. Uh, in the United States, according to Giving USA, last year we did about $373 billion in charitable giving that we can count. This is the stuff that's been given through uh, tax-deductible charities, through online giving, through other stuff. Uh, people throwing a dollar into a hat here and there doesn't end up in that total. But $373 billion last year to support nonprofit work in our communities, to support charities. It's a really big number. And when I work with charities to uh, help them try to understand how do they get money in to do their work, I often get to this first point of, we really got to get a grant for that for the thing, right? That's where we need to go. We have to go out and, and look for some more money. So I want to talk for a second about that part of charitable giving. Foundations or corporate grants um, are where people think about when they think about all this money that's out there. Um, in Minnesota, we've just recently had a new addition to our foundation landscape, the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation, now the biggest single charitable institution in the state of Minnesota. Um, Margaret A. Cargill Foundation has several areas that they are interested in giving in. Arts and culture, environment, animal welfare. If you want to get money from the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation to support your work, you need to be working in those sorts of areas. It's part of what they support. Um, what I run into often with charities when they hear about the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation and others in Minnesota, like, well, we really need to apply to them. And I try to talk to them about, well, they only give in these areas. And like, well, we do that. Right? Because, you know, what we do is something that eventually ends up being nice to people, and then when nice people adopt dogs, it's an animal welfare thing, right? So, therefore, we should get a grant. Um, you can see why people would have this, this desire to go after that cash, because Margaret A. Cargill has more than $3 billion in assets in the bank right now, and that's a really big number. People hear that number and go, oh my gosh, and of course it's gonna get larger before they're done. Um, so right now it's three billion, biggest thing in the state of Minnesota. But that means that the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation has the ability to make grants of about $166 million a year to support the things that they care about. Again, that's a really big number. So people see that and think, wow, we really gotta go after that. We have to pursue that as something that supports our charitable work except when we start looking at the big picture. $264 billion last year came from individuals, not foundations, not corporations, not grants. $264 billion out of that $373 billion that was tracked comes from individual pockets, comes from people like you and me in this room. 70% of that money is individuals giving but we don't often see charities scrambling around going, I really have to figure out how to get more individual donors. They think, I want that big grant. I want that opportunity to get a large chunk of money at one time. When in fact, most of the money that's available is coming in very, very, very small chunks most of the time. And it doesn't go in the same places because when Margaret A. Cargill announces we really want to support everybody um, that wants to do animal welfare, for example, they can put out a statement saying, here's where we will give. And if you want our money, you need to be doing this kind of work. When we talk about the collective philanthropy of all the rest of us, millions and millions of Americans that give every year, we don't have that same voice yet. And that's what I'm kind of excited to start seeing us shift into, that we as individuals can start assuming our own voice to talk about this stuff differently. Where do individuals give money? Because this is different from where institutions give money. If you go to apply for a grant from a foundation or a corporation, you will very often find out that they will not make grants to religious-based institutions, political-based organizations. They have some limits. It doesn't look good for them. There are actually some tax reasons why it's hard to do. So, so often they won't. But if you look at where individuals give their money, $100 billion last year from individuals went to religious-based charitable organizations. Uh, just heard a little bit from uh, Liz earlier about St. Andrews as one of those examples of religious institutions in our community that are supporting really important issues to us. That money is coming from the people that go to those churches and support their work and otherwise. Little bits at a time, here and there. But it adds up to $100 billion across the United States of people saying, this is important to me. 
I want charities to start paying attention to this as an issue. Homelessness matters. I'm giving through my local church. I want that to show up somewhere. I want somebody to care about that. So now we're in a place where all of a sudden we can start seeing our collective power together in ways we've never done it before. Organizations like Blackboard, for example, are online donation processors, and more and more and more donations are coming in through internet-based services, smartphones, all the rest of it, and we can now start getting data from those points. We can start seeing when people give money to a blackboard out there, what does it look like when we see them together instead of just saying, I put 20 bucks in the collection plate or I, I wrote a check to $50 to my local animal shelter. And if you don't see yourself in that big picture, it seems like, well, I'm doing a little something, but you know, it's just what I can do. It's not you know, billions of dollars in a foundation or hundreds of million dollars of grants. It's just what I can do. But together, we do amazing things and we can start shifting the conversation when we see ourselves together. But we do need to understand who are we giving to? Uh, when we were digging in a little bit about Liz's work, we were talking about St. Andrews, for example. If you go online and start checking the registered charities, you're not gonna find just one St. Andrews. Right? There's a lot of them. And if you start looking across the world, there's more still. So we need a system to be able to start understanding where we're giving and why we're giving in those places. And we're building one now called Bridge, the basic registry um, of IDs for charitable organizations. And now when you give to a specific St. Andrews, we'll be able to tell which one you're giving to and why. Well, the why part we're gonna get to in a second. But we'll know which one. And we'll be able to say, this organization is getting charitable support. These are getting some other levels of charitable support. And we'll know which ones are which. It won't be giving to the United Way. It will be giving to the United Way of White Bear Lake or the United Way of St. Paul or the United Way of something. Because that's what's important to you, not just United Way, but your local United Way. Once we start understanding where we're giving the money, we really want to talk about how collectively we are making those choices. Why are we giving money to those places? And now we're building tools to be able to show ourselves as a force of philanthropy. Individuals being that powerful force out there in the world to say this is what we want. Through organizations and ideas like Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday is an effort that's only about four years old now um, that is trying to help people understand if you've got Black Friday and Cyber Monday where you're spending all kinds of money, how about the Tuesday after that? You make a dedicated effort to not only give something in a charitable contribution, but talk about giving something on that day. Share what you're giving so that we can start seeing what matters to you. Give something and share it. Tell people why you're giving. If we do that, we start to get into something called sentiment analysis, which is really cool data nerdy stuff, but it matters for this purpose because it allows us to start gathering why people are making donations where they are and to start showing ourselves as a force to charities and to nonprofits in the world as the people that they should be paying attention to, maybe even more than their foundation partners and their government partners. That they should be looking to us individuals collectively as the folks that really make the difference. Um, I've got a slide up right now about uh, Twitter's trending topics thing, which is machine learning about sentiment analysis. How do we know what's a trending topic on Twitter when it's not a hashtag necessarily? We can look at the words that people use when they publicly talk about what matters to them, and we can say that's trending, that thing matters. If we do that with our giving, if we start saying, I'm giving to St. Andrews because I care about solving some homelessness problems in my community, I can start seeing other people's aggregated sense of where they're giving to, going, they care about homelessness in their community too, their suburban community, their rural community. That matters to them collectively. We have more of a voice than we thought we had before. We've got a real opportunity to make some difference about that. Another tool that we need to pull into this though, um, from that sentiment analysis, um, is to start learning from that data, what does that mean for the rest of us? How do we start learning from our, our neighbors and our friends about what this is? Um, the folks at Amazon have recently announced that they are allowing their artificial intelligence design to be used by anybody that wants to buy it from Amazon. And if you've ever bought a book on Amazon, you have been in this process before where some, you've put in the name of a book or asked for a search, and at the bottom it's like, other users have actually bought 
And then you go down and go, oh, really that other book was kind of closer to what I wanted. You know, I, I thought I wanted this book, but now that I got here and I learned something from all the millions of other people that have been to Amazon before, I find out that my more effective, more interesting thing is actually this. And if we start doing that within our own charitable selections, within other individuals and sharing what matters to us, we start surfacing ideas of we can solve these problems differently, locally, collectively, but we need to stop thinking of ourselves as I only have a $25 donation or I can only make a $50 donation, but rather I am part of $270 billion worth of donors that can really make a difference in this world if we see ourselves together. So we need a few things to kind of get started on this path. One is we need better data about why we're giving. We actually have to give more input. Twitter, Facebook, social media conversations, email, Anything like that is better data about why do you give? What's important to you and why should it matter? We need to ask users to start thinking of themselves as philanthropists and not just somebody that can only do a little bit. But rather, when you give, start telling those charities, I'm giving because you're doing something that matters to me. And I want you to know that this part of your work is what matters to me even though I'm the $25 donor or the $50 donor, because if they start seeing the aggregated demand of millions of $50 donors, charities will respond. They will start delivering services and doing things differently if they know that they've got that opportunity to get access to that. So we need to start gathering and aggregating that data. We need to pull it together in ways that we can start seeing. And Giving Tuesday is a first way to do that. Now we can see what happens when $173 million is given on a single day. And what does that look like? And how does that change the conversation with the charities that support our communities? We're almost there. But then we need to ask our charities to start actually changing what they do based on what we're telling them with our dollars. So we want them to implement some changes and then come back to us and say, we heard you, individual donors that give most of the money. <laughs> Here's what we're doing differently to make our communities a stronger place. So it's a really exciting thing for us to think about. Get out there, tell people when you give, share why you gave to that thing at that time, and then together, our collective voice can start shifting this conversation. Thanks.